Hey, what up minions? Welcome back to another video. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about a Dwarven trap room that I designed where the players might find themselves in an upcoming adventure. The trap is a pretty simple one. I based it on the Poisoned Tempest Trap from Xanathar's Guide, um, page 120. And what I did was I took that trap and modified it to work with my uh, this theme of a dwarven vault that I had been working on. The players are meant to go into the vault and retrieve a key which will open a um, an extra dimensional space where one of their allies is currently trapped. So without further ado, let's get into the video. I'm going to use some old Warhammer fantasy minis that I had lying around for this, but you can use whatever miniatures you have on hand for this project. Start by thinning some black craft paint. I use a thinner akin to Games Workshop's Lamian Medium, but I also alternate that with distilled water in a dropper bottle. Just use whatever you feel is best. This miniature had already been primed with gray primer, so the paint won't have any trouble adhering to it. Go ahead and use a hair dryer to speed up the dry time if you're impatient. Once the black paint is dry, go ahead and dry brush on a bronze color. Build it up in layers so that the finish looks nice and doesn't seem glopped on. I made a patina wash using Ocean Breeze and Lime Green by Craftsmart. I used more Ocean Breeze than Lime Green, probably a 2 to 1 ratio. Then I mixed in a 5 to 1 ratio of distilled water and matte medium in equal parts, and added one or two drops of acrylic flow aid. I'll leave links to these in the description below. I applied this wash heavily to the model and let it air dry. Now we're going to experiment a bit and try our hand at sculpting an anvil. For this I just grabbed one of those tiny packages of black sculpey at Michael's. There was no real science to this, I just tried to approximate the shape of an anvil using a reference image. It was definitely not the correct scale, but since it was for a monument, it was okay for it to be slightly oversized. I ended up having the tip fall off, and decided to sculpt it in two parts, but what you'll see in the video, even though it's sped up, is that I tried many different things to get this looking as close as I could to an actual anvil. I didn't have any sculpting tools, and you'll see in the video I'm using whatever I had on hand, including my craft knives. Be careful if you choose to go this route. After baking, I glued the front piece onto the anvil and began shaping it using some needle files. I'll place a link to these below. These are an invaluable tool for miniature making and crafting in general. Anvils have a lot of sharp edges, so I tried to accentuate the angles as much as possible. This technique really helped me hone in a desirable shape and I'm very happy with how this turned out. To finish it off, I painted it with the same thin down black paint I used earlier, and a dry brushing of gunmetal. I came back with some silver to highlight the edges, but this was overkill and unnecessary. Even so, I'm still happy with it. I felt like I was on a roll, so I decided to add a hammer to the anvil. I started by cutting out a very small piece of Dollar Tree ready board. I noticed the corner of the board had a small dent in it, so I played this to my advantage and cut along that shape to form the back angle of the hammer. I then peeled the paper off both sides of the foam board. Next, I stuck an hors d'oeuvre stick through the hammer as a handle. And 
glued it in place using some tacky glue. black bombed it, painted the handle brown, the head silver, and added some runes to the head of the hammer with the tip of my brush. next part I sped up significantly because I wanted to show you the process I use for casting my Hearst Arts mold. You notice I have a large purple mold and a small blue mold here. The purple mold is a large cast mold that I made from several pieces cast from the smaller blue mold. Doing this speeds up the casting time significantly, but this mold is nowhere near the quality of a Hearst Arts mold and deteriorates rapidly with repeated use. This mold is beyond shot, but I use it anyway. I mixed a 5 to 1 ratio of water to PVA glue in a cup. I'm using the double cup method mentioned on the Hearst Arts website. I added the PVA glue to strengthen the Plaster of Paris I'm using. Plaster of Paris is not durable at all and this will strengthen it slightly. I kept the blue mold nearby in case I had leftover plaster but I ended up having just enough to fill my large mold. You'll notice I have these on a piece of acrylic with a piece of sponge glued to each of the corners. This is so I can pound out the air bubbles. A small vibration motor is set on the side to help this process, though honestly it doesn't do much but shake the camera. After a scrape, I let these sit overnight to cure and then demolded them, trimmed them, and baked them in the oven at the lowest temp for two hours. Next we're going to make the central dais for the master statue to sit on. Since a piece of foam board is just about the same thickness as a fully casted Hearst Arts flagstone tile, I used a 2x2 piece at the center for the dais. cut out a 4 by 4 inch piece of cereal box cardboard. This was way bigger than I needed and I eventually trimmed it down to 3 by 3 You'll see why in a second. I glued the dais to the center of the cereal box cardboard using some tacky glue. I had originally intended for the outer tiles to be full size tiles, but quickly realized these would be far too big and not look at all like I intended. So I checked my stock for half size tiles, and realizing I didn't quite have enough to do what I wanted, I set out to cast more. I'd just gotten done casting and cleaning up the plaster the day before, and really didn't feel like bringing out the plaster again for only a few pieces, so I used a trick I saw on another channel and used hot glue in the mold. Some of you might cringe at this, but it's no more harmful than using resin in the mold as long as you don't do it too often and you properly store and treat your mold. I then glued these pieces to the outside and put some weight on it to dry for a few hours. Black bombed it, 
let it dry overnight. The next day, I painted it using my usual method, pewter gray with a granite gray dry brush and a homemade black wash. I know this painting technique may be boring to some, but I want these pieces to look right when paired with my existing tiles. Sealing these pieces with a construction grade polyurethane helps to protect them, but they'll still chip and need repainting if dropped. Next, I glued together a couple one-inch cobblestone wall sections I had in stock. These would serve as the base for the head statue. I painted it the same as the dais, but sealed the bottom with Mod Podge and black paint for durability. Lastly, I gave the statues and the anvil a liberal coating and poly to protect them from wear. So here we have this door. We have a series of eight statues, all dwarves, and pushing the statues in one direction will either click into place or trigger a poisonous cloud, a la the Tempest Trap. The difference in my trap is that the while the damage scales the poison gas itself doesn't give any other uh, penalties or hindrances to the players. It's just damage. It's a time-sensitive encounter. They're meant to get through this as quickly as they can. If they can't, they're going to suffer a lot of damage, possibly even fall unconscious or even die. None of them are dwarves, so none of them are going to be immune to this poison. Um, the other thing is if they get, uh, if they hit this anvil, they have to hit this anvil once all the statues are in the correct position in order to unlock both the doors. As soon as they move a statue, both of the doors in the room lock. So if they hit the anvil without correctly solving the puzzle, trying to open the doors, in a previous room, a bookcase will slide uh, open and a stone golem will come out and start to come after the party increasing the danger so as the trap goes on as the trap progresses they'll start to hear clicks and uh, gears turning the sound of mechanical uh, uh, mechani mechanisms and um, machinations happening beneath the floor that sound like they're traveling back towards where they'd come from now the goal is the the vault is just beyond this uh, side door over here if they can get through this puzzle which uh, basically just involves them, move, like I said, moving the dwarves into a position. That's not necessarily the right position, but if this were the key to solve it, hit the anvil, and then both the doors unlock. They'll be able to get to the coffers. The coffers are where the treasure is hidden, and uh, that's how they would uh, achieve their goal and leave the dungeon. Now, I had the, the trap take the characteristics of how the Tempest Trap works. That, that being the case, the, the trap acts on its own turn and initiative so that it goes every turn and the characters have to make a constitution save every time this trap deals its damage on initiative count 20. It starts off only doing a measly... Um, it starts off only doing a measly 22 poison damage and for they'll probably be level six by the time they reach this 22 is no slouch that's gonna pick up and my characters uh, my players I'm sorry 
my players are smart. They'll figure this out, I have a feeling. What I want to do, I want to stress them out. I want them to feel like time is running out. I want them to feel pressure. And um, I don't have a system in place to deus ex machina out of them out of this. They've been playing this campaign long enough to know that it's threatening. So I don't fear one of them storming off or something if their characters die. My plan going into this is to make them aware that this is a dangerous encounter that it's possible that they could die and that they need to be prepared. Um, that being said, they have a tendency to play combative with me because I've been dangerous in the past and I've had to adjust to encounters in the past. And for lack of a better word, I've traumatized my party into thinking that I'm gonna hurt them. And that was not my intention. And I don't think a dungeon master should ever do that to their party. There should be a level of trust between the dungeon master and the party. I, didn't know, I did not know this when I first started playing, one of my current players in my group, when he and I first started playing together, I killed him f fairly violently and uh, I we wounded our friendship a little bit because of it. And I learned a lot from that, but it took a while to recover from that. So in the case of this dangerous encounter, letting them know ahead of time in the past has worked, stave off any kind of negative feelings or resentments that might rise up at the table. That being said, I'm not trying to kill them. So if I feel like the damage is too much, I might nerf it. I'm not, I'm not gonna tell them how much damage the trap does. I'm gonna just do the damage and however much damage they take. If I end up rolling the damage and it consistently comes up higher than 22 or higher than 30, the average damage, you know, actually the average damage is 22. If it comes up higher than that, much higher than that, I'm gonna have to nerf it. I'm gonna have to bring it down. But because this, the Tempest trap the damage listed in Xanathar's Guide is a trap for a level, I believe it's a level 10 to 11 party or a level 11 to 13, I can't remember exactly. It's um, set up for a higher level party. So what I did was I went into the traps revisited section in Xanathar's Guide and I took the trap damage for the appropriate level. So this is, according to Xanathar's Guide, appropriate level trap damage. And the fact that I nerfed the Tempest component of the poison and made it just be a poisonous trap uh, means that the damage should be on par. But again, if it's not, I'm going to rule that it will be reduced. So I, I hope you enjoyed this uh, this video and this take on a, a simple dwarven trap uh, slash puzzle. Um, something to stress your players out with for sure. Use statues and use any kind of miniatures to represent the statues. Um, use tokens, use pins, use coins, anything on a battle mat if you're using a battle mat. Um, the room doesn't have to be this, sh this size. The more dwarves you incorporate, the more statues you incorporate, the harder the puzzle is to solve. Um, you can even make it such that the golem appears. If you want to make it harder, you can make the golem appear uh, sooner in the encounter rather than later. Like You can make the golem appear when the trap, uh, the dwarves are, m like a few certain dwarves have moved into a specific position. Like if you had three dwarves here, and you just had, you knew that once the, uh, the trap was active, once the first dwarf was pushed into the wrong position and the trap became active, uh, and you rolled for initiative, if these three statues are all, you know, triggering poison damage and adding to the point, oh, that's the other thing I forgot to mention. If you continuously push dwarves into the wrong position, the poison damage increases. It goes up every round by an additional, ooh, an additional 1d10. It's 4d10 damage every round, and it goes up an additional d10 every time you push a statue into the wrong position. So, uh, if you move that, but if you move that statue, it takes an action to move a statue one square with a DC 10 strength check. They're not heavy statues. I didn't want them to struggle with ability checks as well. I figured that that would be way too hard, so I made the DC low and made it easy not moderate, it, moderate would be way too hard. Um, DC 10 strength athletics check to move a statue and you can only move it one square as an action. So you have, if you have action surge or something like that, you could totally move it twice, but it would take you two turns to move a statue in the opposite direction. So there's that added element as well, which I forgot to mention. Um, so yeah, uh, this, this trap is deadly as all get out and I can't wait to punish my poor, 
unsuspecting party with this thing. So if you liked the video, uh, hit the like button down below, subscribe, um, leave us a comment, you know, uh, let us know, you know, what kind of deviousness, what kind of deviousness have you pulled on your party? What kind of things have you made them, uh, you know, wish they had not come to your game table that night to torture the poor bastards with? Um, if you've, you know, had, you know, will have success you've had with traps at the table, things like that. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want to help out the channel, if you want to support uh, what I'm doing, if you like what I got going on, go head over to Patreon uh, for a dollar more a month. You get, the, you know, all kinds of crazy uh, access to early videos, uh, monthly polls, things like that. Um, it's fairly basic. Uh, if you want to give more than a dollar, pretty cool. I wouldn't mind that either. Um, and if you want to purchase any of the tools you saw used in this video. Uh, check the description below. I'm going to put uh, Amazon uh, affiliate links down there. It's another small way that you can help the channel. I get a very small uh, commission on the things that are sold through there. So, um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is the merch came in. I got the the t-shirt and I got to say, pretty good quality. Um, turned out pretty good. This is the cheaper version of the standard shirt. And if you like, the, if you want another way to support the channel, by all means, pop some swag, man. Uh, people see you coming, they won't know what the hell you're wearing. So. I, I like that, personally. I don't know. Anyway, um, like button, subscribe, comment below. Dungeon Master out. See you next time.